broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, welcome to the MetroVision Idea Exchange Continuous, Comprehensive, and Cooperative Engagement Strategies from the Denver Region. My name is Kevin Priestley, and I'm an Assistant Planner here at the Denver Regional Council of Governments, or Dr. Cog. I'm joined today by a distinguished panel of planners and engagement specialists, and I expect us to have a great conversation about public participation at a variety of scales and new ways to engage the public and solicit input before, during, and after a planning process. Um, so here's our agenda for today. Um, I have just a short set of announcements to run through before we turn it over to our presenters. Um, if you look in your handouts pane of the GoToWebinar panel, you will find uh, this set of announcements as well as PDF copies of all the presentations that you'll see. And the links in this, um, it, the links in the announcements are all live there. So Dr. Cog's Way to Go team is preparing for GoToWork. GoTober is an employer-sponsored challenge to encourage employees to try new, fun, money-saving, and stress-reducing ways to commute to work while competing against other companies for glory and prizes. Company employees are challenged to commute in new ways, think walking, biking, riding transit, or carpooling as many times as possible in October and to track their trips online. Company registration is open now through September 6th, and you can learn more at mywaytogo.org slash gotober. AARP, the Denver Regional Council of Governments, Lifelong Colorado, and Rose Community Foundation are looking to invest in creative projects that help older adults remain and thrive in their communities. We are looking to fund projects in two categories. The first is uh, a community or organization interested in completing a baseline assessment of age friendliness, including the development of a community-wide plan based on the findings of an assessment, or second, a community or organization that previously completed an assessment of age friendliness that wants to implement an action or strategy identified during the assessment and planning phase. Eligible applicants include local governments within the seven county Denver metro area and community partners within these areas that work closely with local governments. The maximum award is uh, $5,000 per project and applications are due before 5 p.m. on Wednesday, August 30th. If you have questions, contact Derek Webb at dweb at drcog.org for more information. The participation company is offering a public participation training at Dr. Cog's downtown Denver offices. This is a highly interactive training course that will benefit new and experienced practitioners alike. It's separated into two modules, the first running from September 11th to the 13th, and the second session from October 21st to the 22nd. Attendance at the first session is a prerequisite to attend the second. The early bird registration deadline is this Friday, August 2nd, and you can find more information on the International Association for Public Participation's website, or if you download the announcements presentation from today, you can click that active register here link. I'm excited to announce that we have several upcoming idea exchanges. On August 13th, we will revisit a previous idea exchange topic, looking at household formations and instances of doubling up in the Denver region with new data and research conducted by Shift Research Lab. In early September, we will resume our Imagine a Great Region event series with City Center at uh, Colorado University, Denver. This session will explore how Colorado and the region's commitment to health and nature intersect and promote economic vitality. And we're finalizing event details this week, so stay tuned in for more information. On September 24th, we will feature presentations from Dr. Cog and RTD discussing the region's first ever active transportation plan and the first and final mile strategic plan. We are working with APA Colorado to broadcast the winner of the first ever Great Places in Colorado Award for National Planning Month in October. More details will be announced about that in the coming months, so stay tuned for further information. Speaking of the 
Colorado chapter of the American Planning Association. It is through their generous support that 1.5 AICP continuing maintenance credits have been approved for the webinar today for attendees listening in person only. You can find the event number on the slide and uh, you can register for credits through the APA national website. Finally, we are obviously using GoToWebinar for today's event. We will accept questions through the questions pane on your GoToWebinar control panel. There's an example shown on the right side of the screen. Please submit questions at any time during the event as they come to you. That way we will be able to move directly into the question and answer phase of the event without having a lag or delay. In addition, we will use GoToWebinar's polling feature several times, mostly to tee off presentations and to offer you time to reflect on your community and local government and how they conduct engagement work. To get used to how that looks, we will start our first poll, which asks where you are attending the webinar today. So please select one of those options. We'll give another couple of seconds for a few more folks to vote. We're about 80% of the way voted. All right. So let's close that poll and share the results. So uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, the majority of folks are from the Denver region. Um, but we do have some good representation elsewhere in the United States, and I really, really hope that you're able to take some lessons that we've implemented here in the Denver region uh, and, and be able to, to take them and, and think about how to use them uh, in other places as well. So with that, um, I have another poll to run, and then we will kick off uh, presentations. Um, so just to tee up our first presentation today, I just want uh, folks to comment on um, how well residents in your community uh, know how to uh, know how the local government makes decisions. Um, do you agree with that statement? Do you disagree with that statement? So on and so forth. We'll give another 20 seconds or so. All right, I'll share that back with everybody. So, um, more false than true. Um, and this is exactly why we are here today, is to figure out how to get people involved in the decision-making process and um, to let them know that, that uh, their voice is just as important as anybody else's. Um, with that, try that. Right. And so our first speaker today is Lisa Hood, the engagement specialist here at Dr. Cog. Prior to joining Dr. Cog a year ago, Lisa was a planning and land use consultant with Clarion Associates in Denver. She has worked as a senior city planner for the city of Minneapolis, responsible for reviewing major land use and historic development proposals. Lisa has a Master of Urban and Regional Planning from the University of Colorado, Denver, and a BA in history from Colorado State University. With that, we'll turn it over to Lisa. All right, thanks, Kevin. Hi, everybody, I'm Lisa Hood, like Kevin said. I am gonna start off with just a few slides to introduce kind of at a high level the regional engagement that we do here at Dr. Cog. Then I'm gonna hand it over to our other speakers to talk about their engagement efforts 
at a local level in the Denver region. And then I'll be back at the end to talk about one specific program that Dr. Cog runs. So a lot of you are from the Denver region and are probably aware of what Dr. Cog is, other than a funny acronym. So Dr. Cog is the Denver Regional Council of Governments. We are a quasi-governmental organization that brings together our 58 member government cities and counties um, in the region to work on regional issues. And each of those governments has a equal voice in our re regional decision making. We do a lot of different things here at Dr. Cog, um, from transportation to regional planning to a more human services um, aspect in our aging services week work. <laughs> and as you can imagine, um, these program areas require different levels of outreach and engagement. And only one of those program areas that we work on has federal requirements for public engagement, and that is our transportation planning function. So Dr. Cog is the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Denver region, and as that, we are required to establish, review, and update our public participation processes. And what that essentially means is that we need to ensure that the public is continually aware of and has access to the transportation decision-making process that we undertake. And these are really basic requirements um, that are laid out, just having adequate notice, responding to public input, using vis visualization, making sure that information is available to people, holding meetings at convenient times and locations, and seeking out and considering the needs of those traditionally underserved. So up until this year, we only had a public participation plan for transportation planning because it was a requirement. But back in May, our board of directors adopted a new public engagement plan, which really takes um, this public engagement processes beyond just the transportation planning function at Dr. Cog and really overlays and standardizes that with um, all of the different things that we do. And the public engagement plan serves mostly as a guidebook for Dr. Cog staff to plan and implement effective public engagement. And it's really intended to be a statement of our commitment to meaningful engagement going forward and really to say how we're going to go beyond just checking that box because those are what we have in the transportation planning requirements are really basic engagement um, features. And so how do we go beyond that to ensure that the engagement that we're getting is really meaningful and effective? Um, so I just wanted to explain a few things or give you a snapshot of what we're doing at a regional level in public engagement. Obviously, there's different challenges with public engagement at every level of government. That's why there's a webinar on this topic. Um, but I would say that in the recent past, um, Dr. Cog has done a really good job at stakeholder engagement. So as kind of a regional convener of our member governments, bringing together our elected officials and staff, um, partner organizations, advocacy groups, and getting them all to um, work together on various regional issues. However, we've had more, it's been more challenging to directly engage the public from Dr. Cog. Um, and so while we like to think that those, um, the stakeholders are representative of the actual public, whether that's the community or city and county, um, they're not necessarily the direct public. So I like to think of it as it's, we want to engage people that are not, their salary is not necessarily paying for them to be at our Dr. Cog table. So with our new plan, we really have a renewed focus on directly engaging the public, um, focusing especially on those underrepresented groups um, that haven't traditionally been a part of our decision-making process or we haven't heard from them. And then also my position, the public engagement specialist is actually completely new to Dr. Cog as of last year. So we've never really had anybody just focusing entirely on public engagement. So with the new position and new plan, we can really put a renewed focus on public engagement in our organization. And some examples of that that we've been working on so far, we've been exploring various online engagement tools. One of our main challenges with regional engagement is just the geographic challenge. So the Dr. Cog region is about 80 miles north to south and 120 miles east to west. And so just geographically, it's challenging for some people or for lots of people to make it to central Denver for a public meeting. Um, so we really want to, we think there's a lot of opportunity in the online engagement space um, to reach more people and hear from more voices. And we've done a little bit of this. Um, so far, we've, uh, in a few recent projects, we. Our um, awesome GIS team developed some 
great web commenting maps um, where people can put in comments. And we've gotten pretty um, uh, significantly more comments that way than we have in similar projects before. So I think that's promising. And we're looking into whether to go even further to an online engagement platform or things like that. Um, we also just recently kicked off our Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan update, and we've been trying to get out into the region rather than holding uh, meetings here at Dr. Cog. So this summer we've gone to several fairs and festivals all over the region and with some activities and games to try to get an idea of people's vision and priorities for transportation in the region. We also want to focus on youth engagement for that project, still trying to figure out exactly how we're going to do that, and then also try to work with um, community-based organizations to reach those kinds of people that we haven't typically heard from in our previous processes. So um, I think we've really reached a new era of engagement for Dr. Cog, or I like to think that since I'm a public engagement specialist, um, and I'm really looking forward to the future of engagement at our organization. This is really um, just a snapshot of what we're doing, and I will um, pass it off to the next speaker, and then I'll come back and talk about one specific program that we're doing. All right. Well, before we move into the next presentation, um, thank you, Lisa. Um, I just want to kick us off with another poll um, before we move into uh, our next speaker. Um, so the question is, choose what best describes your community or local government. And we were asking about um, the engagement plan uh, that you have or, or frankly do not have. Give another 20 seconds for everybody to vote. So we will close the poll and share results. So it looks like uh, most folks uh, have, have uh, ad hoc engagement. Um, and so we're going to turn it over now to uh, Sarah Huntley, um, who is the engagement manager for the city of Boulder. And Boulder has thought about engagement in uh, at, at a higher, at, at kind of the full city level rather than just on an ad hoc project basis. Um, so since October 2018, Sarah has overseen citywide efforts to make engagement more meaningful and inclusive. She provides strategic counsel, capacity building, and implementation support to departments across the city. Sarah also supervises an engagement specialist in the city's neighborhood liaison. Prior to leading the city's engagement program, Sarah was deputy director of communications. She also serves as president of the Colorado chapter of the International Association of Public Participation. She has a bachelor's degree in government from Connecticut College and a master's degree in journalism from Columbia University's School of Journalism. And with that, we will kick it over to Sarah. Thanks, Kevin. I'm delighted to be here. Um, like Lisa, my position is relatively new. I've been uh, focusing on engagement for 18 months, and it's such a pleasure to be able to hear from other people about what your cities are doing and, and learn together. Um, I'm just going to start with a little bit of a fun slide, um, if I can get us to go there, okay, um, about what we like to think about or what we hope for when we think about community engagement. I mean, really, it's such an ideal part of democracy, bringing people together, helping them shape decision making. What could go wrong, right? Well, unfortunately, in my community, <laughs> this is the reality check. Um, especially these days, public participation is really fraught with peril. Conversations are as emotional or more so as they are rational. A lot of times people are bringing past experiences and frustrations into the room, which is really hard as a public agency because you might have had no role in those experiences, but you're definitely feeling the impact. Um, and often staff is left in the middle of what are becoming angry and more divisive conversations. That's where we were in the city of Boulder. Um, in about 2015, 2016, we were seeing a lot of that kind of um, 
divisiveness and just sort of nastiness in public discourse. So in 2016, our city council responding to concerns that the community was bringing to us saying, this is not okay, we don't feel like we're being heard. They established a public participation working group. What I love about this is in order to address community engagement, what did they do? They engaged the community. Right, so they put together this working group of 14 community members, some of whom had a lot of experience in planning and public participation as a field, but many of whom did not. They'd just been active in local government and knew what they liked and didn't like. Um, this group met a long time. It was supposed to be about a six month process and ended up being more than 18 months. They really gave a lot of time and thought to this. And in 2017, they came out with a report I want to talk a little bit about just some of the key findings in the report because it's that report that really has um, shaped the way Boulder has approached engagement um, in the modern day. Okay, so the biggest res um, recommendation they came out with was a really big one. It said change the culture around engagement. Now I'm going to be honest, when I saw that I was like, sigh. Culture change, I mean, how much more difficult does it get? You can take so many different approaches, and the reality is it takes a really long time. But I boiled their recommendations down to two sort of driving points that help me focus this work. First of all, yes, city processes need to change. There's all sorts of cool tactics and techniques we should be using. But more importantly, we first needed to recommit to the concept that public participation matters, that it leads to better decision making, and we kind of as an organization had to be willing to lean into what's scary, right? Because you don't always know what will happen. And you don't know if the public will come up with something completely different, perhaps, than planners and others in the city government are at least initially thinking. The other piece that the public participation working group said, which I think is really important, is it's not just about the organization that's running the process. It's also about the community members who show up. And that we needed to help our community show up differently and really with more realistic expectations about all the factors local governments need to consider. So it's not just one particular viewpoint. There could be lots of diverse viewpoints, but there's also things like financial constraints, legal constraints, environmental goals. So a decision maker really has a lot to wrestle with when they're finally making a call on which way to go. The next key recommendation they made was to create a clear and consistent decision making process. Um, they actually, the Public Participation Working Group, came up with an initial mock-up of this chart that you see on the right-hand side of your screen, and we, we evolved it a little bit, but essentially they wanted us to be very transparent about the steps. So many of you said in the initial poll that you think people are less aware than they are less aware of how decisions are made in your um, communities. Same is absolutely true in Boulder. So we are trying to implement each of these steps in a decision-making process it starts in the top right-hand corner and moves around. It's circular on purpose because sometimes you might go through this whole wheel for one phase of a project, and then for the next phase, you're starting someplace else on the wheel. So that's um, by design. But we're using this language so that our community is really aware. We have these actually in big poster sizes laminated so the project teams are bringing them out into the community and using expo markers to mark where we are on the wheel and what the key points were from previous stages. We also are really trying to be cognizant about letting people know which of these steps is likely to have a focus on engagement. Um, many of them could have focuses on engagement. If, for example, you're defining the issue before embarking, you may want to do engagement around what the issue is. In our case, we've offered our building on engagement that has happened for years about the issue, so we don't spend a lot of time there. And instead, we start um, doing a lot of engagement in the identifying options and evaluating options phases. Lastly, um, the other thing that I was very grateful for the Public Participation Working Group is they said, if we're going to make this a focus in our city, we have to resource this work. So what we had been doing, we've been doing public processes in Boulder for a very long time, and it had basically lived in different departments. And so there were a few people who had, you know, maybe a significant portion of their job engagement, a lot of planners across the city departments, not just in the traditional planning department, who knew how to do outreach and engagement, and it was a portion of their job. So what that was leading to for community members was very inconsistent experiences. 
So if you were engaging with the library, for example, it might look very different if you were engaging with public works or the police department or our parks and rec department. What we tried to do or decided to do is a hybrid approach. So we've created a small centralized best practices coaching team. We purposely live in the city manager's office instead of say the planning department because we want to support good engagement across the entire organization. We have about 22 outward facing departments in our um, city government. We then, um, because we recognize that it's the best work is being done at the local level and also at the department level, it was really important that we um, have departmental liaisons. We created a committee of 25 departmental liaisons. We meet monthly. Many of them are also on subcommittees working on particular deliverables and aspects of the work. We also um, pulled in our city's neighborhood liaison, which was which is great to have as a member of our team. We have a project manager who's doing a lot of work around volunteerism and also racial equity, which both of those areas have huge synergy with community engagement. And then we also have a rock star admin who we could not get through life without. So I'm blessed to have this team, but I'm also really grateful that so many people throughout our city organization have embraced this work. So I wanted to give you an idea um, of what the centralized team brings to the table. We have really two key functions. One is direct service delivery. So under that category, we do help project teams plan and in some cases implement engagement that's consistent with our six strategies and we'll talk about those strategies in a minute. We create processes and platforms that support the public's ability to participate. And the last one is we are building relationships and trust with organizational partners that we then allow our team members and other departments to leverage and help us support and continue. Um, the other piece we do that's huge is capacity building. So we're working on creating the three T's, training toolkits and templates. We um, definitely work with our engagement coordination committee members to develop skills and maximize their involvement. Um, we're also doing some internal training that we've created and we've had 30 members of our staff um, in the organization go through that in the first seven months. And we identify and share professional development opportunities. Now, when you've got a centralized team, there's a little bit of a balancing act because Many six departments say, oh, great, we have some people on board now who are going to come in and do engagement for us, right? So they really want a lot of service delivery. But with just four of us, um, we, we can't possibly meet all the needs of the organization or of our community. So we really feel like the capacity building piece is huge. And we're trying to figure out what the right balance is between those two things. So um, similar to the great plan that Dr. Cog has unveiled, which I'm eager to see after this webinar, um, we created an engagement strategic framework document, which we really use as our touchstone. This is available on our website, and I'm happy to share it with anybody who's interested. But it outlined the city's commitment. It defined core values. It explained the engagement spectrum, which is a key tool we're using, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. It established the staffing structure so departments understood that they are still key players in this process and we need their folks to participate in the process, identify six strategies for success, and we sought to manage expectations about outcomes. So we wanted our council and our community to understand right away that success did not mean that everybody was going to be a happy camper at the end of the day. Right? I mean, the reality is a lot of the decisions we have to make in local government are difficult decisions. And people may participate in the process and, and be very appreciative and um, laudatory about the process itself, but when it comes to the end of the day and the outcome doesn't go the way they wanted it to go, they may start to think more critically and become more skeptical about the process. And so we wanted to make sure that we understood that that's part of the dynamic of the space that we're in together. Okay, this is the engagement spectrum. Some of you have may have seen this. It's adapted from a spectrum created by the International Association of Public Participation. So this is the place we start now for every project that we think might need community engagement. Um, you'll see that the top um, row has four different categories. IAP2 has five. Their last one is in power. We think that happens inherently in the ballot process in the city um, when citizens put things on the ballot and vote. So we don't really plan for that. We allow that to be an organic democracy-based system. So we went with the inform, consult, involve, collaborate. 
the goal is on the top. What the goal is, um, if you're in the informed space, for example, is to provide the public with balanced and objective information. Um, consult means that you're actually starting to obtain some public feedback. Involve means you're working directly with the process, um, uh, with the public throughout a process to make sure that concerns and aspirations are understood and considered. And then collaborate, which is the buzzword we all love to use the most, is when we actually sit side by side, staff members and community members, often a much smaller group of community members than you might get to be involved at the consult level, for example. We roll up our sleeves and come up with preferred solutions together. Um, the bottom part is the part that I think has really been a key difference in our discussions in Boulder. We, when we choose where we are in the spectrum, and it might vary at various points in one project, or it might be the same for an entire project, we're making a promise to the public. And we're taking that promise very, very seriously. So on the informed spectrum, which many of our communications departments do great work in the inform area, right, and also some in the consult area, we're promising to keep you informed. And I would add maybe to that, keep you informed in a timely way, right? Um, the consult is we're starting to listen to and acknowledge your concerns and really be able to tell you how your feedback influenced the decision. We might share drafts and proposals out with the community and they have a chance to see the work as it's happening. Involve, again, is usually a smaller group still and we are um, working perhaps repeatedly a series of meetings with a smaller group of folks to really work on drafts and refining those drafts. And when somebody's in the involve or collaborate category, they expect more in return for their service to the project, right? They want to know what's going on. They want to be kept in the loop. They want to know how their input is being utilized. And then lastly, with collaborate, we're going to work together to come up with solutions. And this is the part that's really important. We're going to incorporate your advice and recommendations into the decisions to quote the maximum extent possible. So it's really important when we're in the collaborate space that your decision makers have signed on to being in that space because they are ceding a certain amount of their authority to make a decision to the process and to the folks who are at the collaboration table. So getting that understanding up front and making sure folks are comfortable with that understanding is critically important. Um, I mentioned that we came up with six strategies for success that have really been guiding our work for the first 18 months. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through each of these. The first one is to learn together. We knew that in order to change the culture, both in our organization and in our community, that we needed to create a culture of continuous learning. We had to say, we're going to try new things, and they might not all work, and that's okay. And we're going to build on the things that do work to take them to the next level every time that we can. So creating that expectation, managing expectations, and kind of dealing with the perfection syndrome that I think a lot of us have in when we're in public service. We want to get it absolutely right the first time. We also wanted to help people know what to expect. So the decision-making wheel is a part of that. But we're also sharing our engagement plans online. We're saying this is where we are, this is the spectrum level that we're going to be in, and here's the kind of different ways you can participate so that people aren't surprised or don't feel blindsided when something happens later on. The third block is cultivate respectful and inclusive relationships. We're going to talk a little bit more about some of our inclusion efforts in a moment because it's a key focus of our work. Um, but we wanted to bring people to the table who have not traditionally been a part of community conversations and civic dialogue. We need to be transparent. We need to use the right tools. And then it's very important that we evaluate and evolve. So if something's not working, we cut the cord. It's not working. We're going to move on to something else. If something is working, what are the key essence? What's the key essence of why it's working? And how can we replicate that in other areas? Okay, so I'm sure what you really want to talk about is what this looks like in our community and some different ways we've done engagement um, related to specific projects. So I've chosen um, a sort of collage of photos that really demonstrate the fact that this is happening in every city department. So it's not just traditional planning roles, but it's happening in every city department. Each of these pictures illustrates a lesson that we've learned. So I'm going to just quickly talk through the pictures. So the one on the left, um, the biggest picture on the page here, is for our Alpine Balsam um, area plan process. So that is a traditional, more traditional planning process. We purchased the former uh, Boulder Community Hospital site 
Um, they've moved to a location where they can expand, and the city's trying to decide how we want to leverage that great asset in the middle of town. We did pop-up events. Um, we tried first, you know, the traditional meeting, asked people to come to us, and they didn't really come to us. We got like 40 people at our big, exciting launch. Um, and so we decided to go to where people already were. This is actually in a park, and they were having a concert in a park evening. So the um, a symphony orchestra was there, and there were tons of people. We set up um, out next to the park, and not only did we set up a table, but I then walked to the crowd and told people what we were over there talking about and encouraged them to come on over. We might have done a little bribing with some popsicles, which was great because it was a summer evening and popsicles are cheap, and they brought the kids over, and then that brought their parents over. So that was a great lesson. We're trying to pop up in places where people already are, and we're adding value to something they want to do anyway, right? They were there to enjoy orchestra. We did not interfere with any of the actual music. We talked during intermissions and things like that. And we got about 85 people to engage in our project in that hour and a half. Um, the next slide, which is the one to the top right hand corner, you'll see a bunch of people sitting around a poker table. Um, they were betting for chocolate, not money. But this was an event that we held that was just a way to get people to get to know staff and council in a non-charge environment. So this is our um, uh, deputy finance director sitting next to a city council member, sitting next to two community members, and the, the um, blackjack dealer is actually our municipal court administrator. <laughs> and they just came, the whole night was built around games and activities to get to know um, city officials as human beings, right? Because so much of what we do relies upon our ability to form connections as human beings. Um, attendance wasn't great, I'm gonna be honest. Uh, we didn't get great turnout for this, but the people who came had a fabulous time and began to build some really strong relationships. The bottom picture is just an example of making your question super simple, and super fun, so that people can do it like five, five minutes or less. Um, as we kicked off the East Boulder sub-community planning process, um, it was right around Valentine's Day, so our team said, well, let's be a little kitschy, and we put these boxes in various cafes and coffee shops and um, near a bus stop, I think, and just asked people to tell us what they love about the sub-community area today so that we could make sure that we aren't fixing what's not broken, right? In the next phase of the process, we're going to talk about what you want to change, but right now we're just in inventory and assessment phase. So quick and easy, super fun. Um, we got, uh, I believe it was about 150 responses, and these were out for like two days, so. Okay, a couple more pictures here. Um, the two pictures on the left-hand side are both from an event that our um, engagement liaisons came up with. It's called What's Up Boulder. It's a citywide open house information sharing event that we've now held three of. Um, they're annual. Um, we, had, we have over 25 projects across the city with tables and booths and information for community members. We make it a fun, fair atmosphere, so it's kind of like what a lot of the community festivals are that I go to, but instead of being community organizations um, talking about the work they're doing, it's city services and programs that are doing work. Um, I particularly like this one up at the left um, column because that was our parking enforcement folks, and you often don't think, well, how is parking enforcement going to engage with the community? If they are engaging, it's probably not in a very positive way, right? So they're thinking about putting some new kiosks in. So they actually, I saw them unloading the truck, and I was like, are you serious? They brought in the old kiosks and the new kiosks so that people could have that interactive, actually feeling the difference between the two. And then they voted, that voted quickly on the things that were most important to them when we were deciding what technology to choose. Um, the pictures on the right top corner um, both represent the lesson we've learned about actually listening and listening with an intent to understand, not listening with an intent to respond. Um, sounds very simple, but it's actually a pretty difficult concept, especially for people like me who tend to want to jump into the conversation. It's taking a lot of skill building for us to really develop that. Um, the right-hand top corner recognizes that um, there are still community members. Some want the quick drive-by engagement opportunity. That's all they have time for. But there are some community members who really want to get granular. They want to get very involved in your project. And there's definitely places for them to do that in the hall, the collaborate space. And this is an example of a 
session that we held that was more around involve. And then the bottom one is um, help our folks who have a hard time sitting in a room actually move people as part of your engagement process. So we are implementing walking tours as a lot of our a lot of our engagement. This particular one was walk with a council member. So the gentleman in the middle who's talking with the hat is actually a council member. And what's great is we choose parts of town where we can highlight particular projects or issues that are coming up in that part of town. But in between the different stops, people can just sidle up to the council member and talk about whatever's on their mind. And it's really, um, it's been very nice to watch people talk while they're walking side by side. It's less, naturally less contentious, right? Um, and it also helps people get out and exercise, which is something that I want to be doing anyway, and explore a part of the walkable boulder. The last set of slides that talk about um, what this looks like um, on the street really focuses on our goal of making inclusivity a top priority, even to the point of engaging less connected community members instead of our usual influencers. So that's going to sound a little bit um, scary to people in communities who are used to being squeaky wheels, who know how to work the system. We're now changing the system. We're not taking their seat away from the table by any means, but we're adding seats to the table. And if that means we have to prioritize the ways we do engagement to add those seats at the table, that's what we're going to do. Um, we're certainly people can continue to write to council. We, we received 15,000 emails to council last year. Um, so that is a well-used process. We're not breaking that process in any way, but we're adding new things. Um, really focusing on um, some of the language gaps in our community. Boulder is a very homogenous community, um, but we have about 7% of our population is um, of Latinx origins and some portion of those are um, monolingual. So we're really trying to meet that need. We're also having a uh, growing population um, of community members from the Bosnian region. Um, and also we have some diversity, uh, the, the campus supports us. So we have people from a variety of different cultures and we wanna make sure we're engaging them. This picture in the middle is one of my favorite, the one with the sticky notes. We did a focus group for um, community members talking about, um, about new housing possibilities. And the left-hand one I love, we did a plus delta coming out of the session. And one of the community members said, for the first time, I felt like I was part of my community. Um, and that was really, it gives me goosebumps still to hear it because it tells me that um, we are helping people understand we actually want them to be a part of the conversation and that their voice matters. Okay, so measuring our progress. How do we know how we're doing? Um, what are we going to build on for the future? Well, if I'm being honest, which I like to think I am at all times, we're not here. <laughs> we're not in the unicorns and rainbows. And likely, we never will be, because this is really hard work, right? And if you're making decisions that are going to impact an entire community, there's going to be people who are pleased with the decision, people who are not pleased with the decision. Um, so this is perhaps an unattainable goal or dream, um, but we're making progress. I want to talk a little bit about what some of that progress has been. So programmatically, um, we have definitely strengthened and developed new relationships with partners. Um, we have regular check-in points with organizational partners. We've developed some guides. So if you want to, you're in a department and you want to do outreach and engagement with, say, our lower income community and you want to partner with Boulder Housing Partners, which runs a lot of the properties that people live in, we have a whole guidebook on how to do that, what that relationship looks like, what they're expecting from you, what you can expect from them. Um, it's been hugely successful. We've also identified and began to address language and equity gaps. We um, are um, piloting a program that we call Community Connectors. Lots of folks might know them as cultural brokers, but really it's the concept of using trusted community members within groups that you're trying to reach to be the ambassadors for your project. Um, we pay um, our Community Connectors, and it's been um, very successful for us, especially in the um, non-English speaking communities, because there's both the language barrier and then there's the trust barrier. 
We um, supported six community connectors last year. We're now onboarding five new connectors. We created in-house curriculum and trained 30 city employees in engagement culture and planning best practices. Um, we pulled a lot of the great training that comes from the IAP2 training that Dr. Cog is offering. I can't say enough about that training. It's really fabulous. It was foundational, um, really an eye-opening for the city of Boulder. About 25 of us took it about two years ago. And it shaped a lot of our work. So I would encourage you to, to do that if you are at all able to do so. Um, we also created a toolkit with templates, how-to sheets, and checklists. We have an internal web page we call the Outreach Outpost. It's a picture of a little owl on a tree branch. And um, it's one of our most um, frequently visited internal web pages where we give people tips. And we also have like vendor lists and things like that. So people don't have to recreate the wheel every time they're planning an event. We launched two online tools. So Be Heard Boulder is um, an engagement planning platform. Um, it's powered through um, Bang the Tables uh, Engagement HQ software. We last year had 24 different projects featured on Be Heard Boulder. People could do quick hit interactive engagement around. And City Text Boulder, which is a new texting platform, which is open to anybody, but we're really um, targeting it towards less connected people members so we're sending out texts two or three times a week on topics they tell us they care about like transportation child and family services financial assistance legal rights things like that and they also can text back questions they might have for city staff um, we're piloting more informal ways to interact with council so that walk with council didn't look anything like somebody standing at a podium with a two-minute clock running right this was actually getting out to the community having informal ways for you to talk to your elected officials and then we established some key indicators for measuring progress the reality is even though the community was telling us they weren't thrilled with what we were doing with engagement we had no baseline data so this first year and a half has really been trying to figure out how we're going to get baseline data so that we can measure progress moving forward. Um, so we, when we talked about how we were going to measure our success, we recognized that when you're talking about community engagement, there's some things that the plan, engagement planner can control and some things that you can't control, right? So people might look at success in lots of different ways. When council adopted our framework, they told us that there were two needles they wanted us to um, make sure we were moving and moving in the right direction. Okay? Um, the first was that when people are participating, they feel heard. Doesn't mean the decision is going to necessarily be what they want, but that they feel heard and they feel valued. The second piece is that we're getting more people to the table to be participatory in our government, so that engagement is inclusive. Um, so. In order to find some baseline data, we decided to start with our community survey. So Boulder, like many other communities, does a periodic check-in. Um, we, we usually hire a, a survey company who really does the best work possible around this area. And we had done a survey in 2016, and we did the same survey in 2018. And as I was looking through that survey, I realized that there were quite a few questions, about eight different areas that, to me, were key indicators we should be looking at in connection with engagement. They had to do with, like one of them asked how good the government was at getting your feedback before they made decisions. So ding, 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 there's a perfect indicator, right? But some of them were a little bit more vague, like your trust of government, your government's, um, your sense of government being honest, your sense of government being representative of all people, those kinds of questions. And we, so we were able to pull out from 2016 and 2018, and we'd only been in effect for about 10 months when the 2018 survey was taken, but we are beginning to see a couple of points increases in all of those areas, which to us indicates that um, we're at least headed in the right direction. Right. We also are getting lots of qualitative feedback. Um, I know people who really want to make data-driven decisions often don't look at qualitative in, input as, as, me, as a meaningful data source, but I consider it to be very meaningful because it's how people are feeling and experiencing our processes. Um, we are trying to capture that qualitative feedback in a data source by having post-process evaluations. So there's questions that we're asking every department to ask at the end of a process. And they have things to do with, did staff explain to you how your input would be used? Do you feel like you understand the decision-making process that led to this decision? 
Um, things like that that really we can ask repeatedly no matter what the project is to get a sense of how we're doing. We're definitely seeing new faces and first time participants. Um, I had one person come to an event we held on community broadband and he was sort of a techie type and he said, you know, I've never been to a city hosted thing and I thought it was going to be really boring and this was super fun and I'm coming back. Um, which was really great. And then we're getting good recognition by professional associations who do this work. Obviously, everybody likes to win awards, and awards are great, and they boost the morale of my staff, but I really look at it as, you know, are we um, running in the, in the population of people who are creatively thinking about this at all times? Are we part of that, that group, that community, and making sure that we continue to be engaged with people who are thinking about this outside of what we often call the Boulder bubble, right? Okay, so that's my last slide. This is definitely a continuing journey for us, and I'm happy to take questions, think through challenges, and really learn from what you're doing as well. Um, I've got my contact information here. I believe the slides are part of your package, so um, don't hesitate to reach out, and I think we're going to take questions at the end of all the presentations, so I'll hang on um, out and see if we can you know, have some conversation afterwards. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I do have another poll um, to tee off our next presenter. Um, and that asks, uh, on a scale from true to false, how well uh, your community or local government uh, reaches traditionally underserved communities. We will go with another 20 seconds. All right. So um, it looks like more false than true uh, was was. Um, I, I guess it's not really a winner, um, but with with that, uh, we're, we're going to turn it over to Thornton and Glenda Lannis, um, who has uh, worked on been working on a comprehensive plan and did a lot of early and often outreach um, in the Latinx community in Thornton. So Glenda has been the planning and policy manager in the city of Thornton for 18 years. She oversees the development of long range plan and with her team has developed station area master plans, revitalization plans, health impact assessments, and hazard mitigation plans. Most recently, she led efforts to undertake a major comprehensive plan rewrite called Tomorrow Thornton. Um, prior to working with Thornton, Glenda has worked in long range and current planning in Douglas County, the city of Loveland, Colorado, and the city of La Quinta, California. She received her planning degree in South Africa and has more than 30 years of planning experience in the United States. And with that, I turn it over to Glenda. Thanks, Kevin. So um, first of all, I'd like to say that the Thornton Comprehensive Plan Rewrite Project has been a team effort. This in particular refers to the initial visioning outreach that is the focus of this presentation. Thornton City staff had the help of many others, in particular a team of consultants, which I will refer to in a moment, and of course the Thornton community. Um, so inclusion was one of the overall intentions of this project, and this is exhibited by the logo, as you can see, Thornton Tomorrow Together. Sorry. A little bit here. I'll just start talking about the next slide. So, um, the uh, Thornton Comprehensive Plan rewrite process um, is uh, exhibited by this little flow chart that's on the screen. And uh, like many other communities, Thornton embarks on a major update of their comprehensive plan every 10 years. And uh, we completed uh, phase one, the visioning part that we're talking about today, at the end of 2018. And uh, we're now on the draft plan stage, 
with the goal of an October public hearing with the City Council, which of course is before the next election in November. That's always the critical time you want to get in before you have a change of City Council members. Um, so, Thornton at a glance, um, population um, over 140,000, the sixth largest city in Colorado, incorporated in 1956, uh, certainly a suburban community, and geographically we have the older south part of town and we have the north which is newer. <clears throat> the uh, community is fairly diverse. Um, in particular, about a third of Thornton residents consider themselves Hispanic Latino, and that, that percentage is growing. It has grown from 21% in 2000 to currently over 33% um, of, of Thornton's of of overall population. And other smaller groups are also represented, such as Chinese, Hmong, Vietnamese, and Russian, and other communities, but um, these comprise less than 1% or 2%. So um, looking at our overall outreach goal, so our obvious overall uh, outreach goal was that um, we wanted to reach as most, many people as possible for this uh, comprehensive plan. So the visioning stage was considered very important because we felt this is where we could reach the most people and with a broader, less technical concepts and gather interest and, and this would hopefully continue throughout the plan, we would engage people early and keep them interested. We also wanted to do a wider effort than last time, uh, where the focus was on communities and um, committees and community meetings. And then um, the secondary goal, as you can see, is also really important because that's our responsibility as a public employees. We need to get out there and represent the city well and uh, connect with people and let them know the city's there to help them. And, uh, but overall, we wanted to be as inclusive as possible and reach as many parts of the community as we could. And this, this picture is a great photo of how we uh, went to visit a lot of uh, uh, high school classes and engaged with them. It, it was fantastic and we learned a lot of new things and got very inspired. So then talking about uh, um, overall um, engagement philosophy. So um, as you can hear, I come from a different country. So hey, I feel as though I, I have a little bit of an insight into uh, considering people's different values and uh, seeing things through other people's eyes. And um, uh, as you have saw from the data, the Hispanic Latino community is well represented in Thornton. But uh, we've had limited success in engaging in the percentage of those residents that uh, speak Spanish or that uh, don't really involve themselves in civic affairs very much. So we felt doing this for the comprehensive plan was considered essential, especially looking at the future growth of, of that community and uh, the, the presence of it in, in, in the city. Another group we wanted to uh, get through to and we felt we had neglected in previous planning efforts was the youth. And um, after all, they are the future. Those are the people that are going to have to experience what we plan. So um, now um, it would be great to have enough resources to outreach to everybody in the city, particularly with something like a comprehensive plan. Uh, but of course you can't, you just don't have those time and, and money resources. So we uh, decided to do a wide outreach with some extra attention focus on the Hispanic Latino community and the youth. We didn't do this by ourselves. We had help. We had excellent assistance from our consultants and um, our overall strategy reflected in the consultants we chose. We had CDR as our um, facilitation and stakeholder engagement group to do primary outreach. In addition, we engaged Cultivando, who is a leadership, advocacy and capacity building organization that works in collaboration with community leaders and organizational partners. And very importantly, they have very strong connections to the Hispanic Latino community in Adams County. And that was critical because they were very, very local and they had worked with us before and worked with other communities in the surrounding area. And then for the planning, um, which of course is the, doing a, a comprehensive plan, we relied on Clarion, who are um, our planning, land use and real estate engagement firm. So um, overall, we thought that the team uh, had worked well, particularly in the visioning stage, and we're still working really well together to achieve the goal of taking the plan to council in October. 
just some visioning outreach highlights. Um, we did uh, quite a big variety of things. Um, we uh, touched about 1,500 people in the community. Difficult to tell, you know, some might be doubling up and, and it's really hard to tell. But nevertheless, we felt we um, got three times more uh, connections with people than we did for our last comprehensive plan in 2007. And um, so we had uh, uh, community and neighborhood meetings, booths at community events like ice cream socials and at Harvest Fest. We engaged more directly with people at focus groups and uh, stakeholder interviews. And um, we uh, interviewed members of the Hmong, Vietnamese and Russian communities um, as part of those focus groups and other interviews. We, uh, as I mentioned before, we outreach extensively to the youth and visited over 11 high school classes. Uh, the school districts were very um, uh, uh, happy to see us there and, and get some engagement with, with young people and let them know um, that there's such a profession as a planner and also uh, how they can influence uh, the future of Thornton. The, I just wanted to talk in particular about the Hispanic Latina outreach. It was wide ranging. And of course, uh, we had a uh, lot of help from Caltabando. They facilitated focus groups, invited community members to attend community meetings and um, community events. They conducted one-on-one -on -one home visits and small group gatherings. They staffed booths at grocery stores and movies in the park. And uh, over 280 Spanish-speaking surveys were filled out. So that was a, a great resource. Very importantly, um, all community meetings and other events, um, except for the very small ones, some of the very small ones, had Spanish interpretation and uh, key material was provided in both English and Spanish. Uh, for example, the postcard invites. And when we talk about Spanish interpretation, that's a lot of it was direct interpretation. We had someone who translated on the spot. And so people, English-speaking people, could listen to what the Spanish people said and uh, speaking people and, and the other way around. So that was uh, really uh, popular and, and worked super well. So key items for the Hispanic and Latina outreach, and, and I want to say here for sure that this is my observations, and I'm no expert in this area, and that's why we engage uh, specialists to do this work, to help us with this work. And we thought they did a fantastic job, and that's uh, Cultum under our local, um, local group. So I think the key elements are, first of all, appropriate communication. You need into integral local knowledge um, and, and how, uh, how people like to be uh, engaged. It's not enough just to have some Spanish-speaking people on your team. You need to have people that really know the community. And the local promotoras, who um, are community advocates, um, they were key in providing a bridge to this community. And um, also, as I mentioned before, translation of key items is important. It's not only for those people who don't speak English so well, it also shows acceptance and welcoming to, to, um, to everyone, that everybody's accepted and, and their thoughts are, are well regarded. The other thing I wanted to mention about um, the, the outreach here is that um, People want to feel uh, comfortable and welcomed before engaging in uh, community input. So you, you need to uh, go to the places that people people are, as, um, as Sarah mentioned in one of her um, uh, things she mentioned earlier. You need to uh, see where they feel comfortable, not necessarily civic places, um, outside grocery stores, booths at movie night, um, Harvest Fest, which is a festival we have every uh, fall and we also have a spring one which we uh, was cancelled so we couldn't attend that we we're kind of disappointed and then of course in people's homes and um, daycare food and giveaways are all super important and you've got to make it fun for people give a good reason for them to come along and uh, pizza works just want to let everybody know pizza's <laughs> a really good idea <laughs> And um, as I mentioned, key items was translated into Spanish and direct interpretation was provided. And um, we felt that those were really important items. So what came out of it? What did we find out uh, from our, uh, focusing in on this particular community or the segment of this particular community that's hard to reach? And so the overall input was similar in many ways to input from the rest of the community. And there were comments on family-oriented issues, housing, family recreation, kids' safety, transportation. 
And um, where there was a, a little bit of a difference was there was a strong desire for equity and inclusion. And um, also the need for a community resource center where people could go and find out about a lot of things, especially in Spanish and, and, and uh, where, where they could uh, connect with people and, and other services. And then, of course, a, an aspiration to participate in civic affairs. We really were, that was a, a wonderful thing to find out. So how did we actually pull all of this together? Well, here we have our vision themes. And so the outreach was summarized into these um, theme circles, we call them, that um, I personally call them the front and hug. And I know everybody laughs when I say that, but truly, after this outreach experience, I really felt as though we got to know the community and, and everybody had a lot of positive things to say, or well, most people had positive things to say, and, uh, and, and it just felt like we'd given Thornton a little bit of a hug and said, how are you and, uh, and how are you doing? And please help us create this plan. So we had um, the circle really demonstrates inclusion being a circle and, um, demonstra and it has eight different themes. And important, very importantly, is the center circle, the silver circle, which indicates an equitable and inclusive Thornton. And that is in the middle there and it really um, influences and is present in all the other themes. So here I'm just going to flip through a couple of slides. Uh, these are what we uh, uh, delved in a little deeper on, on the themes and we created goals. And I just wanted to point out some of the goals that uh, carried on the connection to the input for, from the Hispanic Latino community. And uh, so under the cultivating identity and image, we have foster an equitable and inclusive community and celebrate our cultural diversity. So under creating quality and diverse neighborhoods, we have a goal, provide a mix of housing opportunities, which applies to most people in the community who are interested in this particular aspect. Then we have connecting community, people, and places. And so um, in here, it, it, it addressed a lot of uh, physical uh, uh, connections, but also um, ensuring that, the very last one, ensuring that all residents have the ability to access and participate in civic affairs. So that was an important one to carry through. And then um, the last example I have here is under providing resources and building relationships. That uh, we have a goal connecting, uh, have a couple of these goals relate to connecting people with services and resources because that was something that was strongly voiced. So these were all um, summarized in a very detailed, fantastic report uh, on the left hand side that uh, has quotes, uh, a lot of, uh, lot of detail on, on what we received. We wanted to make sure that we uh, documented it. And then what we uh, produced out of that was a more formal document, um, uh, the community vision document, and uh, that has all the goals and the visions and explanation of uh, the, the outreach process. And these are available on our um, website, which is thorntontomorrow.com. So results. So people were um, very happy to be included and grateful to be included in the process, particularly in the uh, Hispanic Latino community. And people um, are now more involved and they're more uh, encouraged to take part in civic affairs. And so it's really important that one needs to approach this, the community with flexibility. Because sometimes it takes a longer time to build relationships of trust, particularly with government-led efforts. This is really important. And there's a better outcome in the community commitment and involvement when the community is reached directly rather than just participate in formal outreach events at city facilities. You got to go where people are and make them feel comfortable. There was some pushback um, uh, on our choice to have a specialized Hispanic Latina outreach effort from a few of Thornton residents. So lessons learned. So um, some general comments on that. So you've got to really, really focus on the details. You've got to make sure you invite 
everybody. You got to spend a lot of money on mail outs, property owners plus residents and business owners and everybody, and and uh, to make sure you connect with everyone. And then of course you got to make them welcome um, at outreach events. It's great to be creative. And um, we had people, including our city council, draw their vision and we're beautiful little sketches and we had goats at Harvest Fest. Everybody loved cuddling the goats. <laughs> and uh, we had a lot of giveaways, uh, these glasses that glow in the dark and, uh, and a number of other things. And we even created a, a story map, which is on our website and uh, everybody's welcome to go and look at that. Uh, one uh, tip that I just wanted to throw out there and that is you get a lot of other questions at these outreach events. People want to know stuff about traffic, they want to know our upcoming development projects. So we uh, have a laptop at the larger community events and uh, so you can quickly go to the laptop and look up the answer to someone's question. Maybe it's not related to the project but you really are serving the community and you're representing the city. So you do need to be able to provide that service. So overall, the message is to be flexible and to learn throughout the process. You know, some stuff goes wrong, you do better next time, and um, that, that's, that's how it goes. So um, just in, in conclusion here, um, so the overall, and here's a, a great shot of the goats that were at the uh, Harvest Fest. As I said, the Thornton Fest was cancelled, and we had the baby goats at the Thornton Fest, but unfortunately it was cancelled. and. We had them though this year, that, that was lost. We had them this year and people like cuddling those little goats. So, um, but uh, overall we uh, want to say that, um, of course, equity and inclusion is super important. And um, we, uh, you know, your, the land use uh, policies that you have in your comprehensive plan, it's not, you not only have land use policies, you have wider community-based uh, strategies in there too, because everybody's not talking only about land use. We, uh, we have set ourselves a high standard for future plans and we'll, it might be a little bit of a challenge, but we'll have to step up to that. And then, um, of course, um, uh, our experience and uh, the results of the outreach really reinforce that input for as many of the community as possible is really desirable and works well. And, and of course, will ultimately result in a, a, a better plan, a better comprehensive plan. So uh, that's the end of my presentation, and I'll now turn it over to Kevin. Thank you very much, Glenda. Um, and to tee off the next presentation, um, I just have a quick poll for you um, asking if residents know where to find information about and provide feedback on issues before the city council. <coughs> Give you another 20 seconds to fill this out. And while we're waiting, uh, last few seconds here, just a reminder to uh, put questions into the question box um, when you can so we can get a couple of those <coughs> answered by the end of the session today. And we'll close out the poll and share it back. So um, there's a, a mix, but it looks like more false than true on this one as well. Um, with um, yeah, with with uh, more people not knowing where to find input uh, and where to provide input, and um, it tees off the next presentation really well um, because uh, Lakewood has been doing just that and providing, uh, trying to get more uh, feedback online for city council issues. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Travis Parker. Travis Parker is the planning director for the city of Lakewood. Since 2011, he has led updates of the Lakewood zoning code, the city's comprehensive plan, major planning efforts around the W line light rail, and uh, he was instrumental in developing the city's first sustainability plan. More than 20 years of public planning experience in Virginia, Indiana, Iowa, and the District of Columbia, Travis has a focus on land use planning and zoning code interpretation. He's a Master of Public Administration from George Washington University and a degree in urban planning from Iowa State. I'll turn it over to Travis. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, yeah, I think that question kicks it off really well. So far, we've been talking about planning at the macro level, whether it's across departments of projects in Boulder or you know throughout an entire comprehensive planning process in Thornton. 
I want to talk about a specific point in time in the develop in the uh, public engagement process, and that's the decision making point. That's the the public hearing in front of a planning commission or in front of a city council. Every city has these meetings, you know, a weekly or biweekly meeting. And the question that we wrestle with in Lakewood is, are we getting the most out of these meetings? We started looking at this in 2016, and we came across a few issues that we, you know, that really concerned us. First is just lack of participation, right? Uh, you know, your average city council meeting doesn't have a lot of people there, and planning commission even less so. Secondly, when people do show up, they tend to be fairly limited demographically. We, we really have a problem getting people to our public hearings that represent uh, our diverse community in terms of age, in terms of race, in terms of yeah, economic status, in terms of education. Um, and that's something we've had a challenge we really wanted to take on. And finally, when people do come, when there's a controversial issue um, that, we're, that we're tackling and the room is full, the, the voices that tend to dominate tend to be the extremes on one side or the other, people that are really worked up about a development proposal in their neighborhood or really excited about some new uh, initiative that the city council is considering. And the more moderate voices, the, the more constructive, perhaps, voices tend to get drowned out and at best drowned out, at worst, uh, you know, scared away. And so... In Lakewood, we wanted to tackle these ideas, and, and we looked at the rest of our lives and how, you know, in our life we can use our phone or our laptop to, you know, order food or, or order a car or buy a movie ticket or, for that matter, watch a movie, right? But we can't participate in our local public hearing on our phone. And that's, the, that's what we wanted to try and tackle in Lakewood is if we can't get good participation at our meetings, let's take our meetings to our people. And so we spent a couple years uh, looking at different ways to tackle it. We found out that, that this doesn't exist, at least not to the level that we wanted to tackle the problem. Um, and so we realized we'd have to create it ourselves. Um, we went through a bunch of search processes to find the right partner and eventually came up with a public-private partnership to build out a website that we ended up calling Lakewood Speaks. I'm going to walk you really quickly through what that website entails and then talk about some of the results of its use. Um, so we had a, a series of goals, first increasing engagement, uh, as I talked about, getting more people involved in the process, expanding awareness of what our council is doing and the decisions that they're making. A lot of people don't know what's, you know, what's being considered in their community. And find those are <coughs> exterior goals from an interior goal. It was, of course, this cannot add staff time, right? We can't, we don't have more resources to put towards our, our public hearings. So we need a solution that, that doesn't make it harder or more difficult on our staff. So beginning in 2017, uh, Lakewood Speaks went live, and this site is basically the public hearing online. It's a replication of these hearings. So when we send out notifications, when we post a property with a development proposal, or when we send out um, notifications of a case to neighbors of a property, or when we post a, a flyer in City Hall, it not only contains the time and date of the public hearing, but it invites people to go to the website and uh, learn about the case and, uh, and offer, their, offer their input there. When you go to the website, you'll see a series of upcoming cases, both City Council and Planning Commission. You find the case that you like, you click on it, and it takes you to the case page. This page is, in actual fact, you know, legally part of the public hearing. This page contains all of the information that's used in the decision-making process up to you know, the live comment and discussion by the, by the council members. You know, at the top of the page, we've got a summary of the case. We've got maps, uh, you know, that, that take you to the location and, and get you on our interactive GIS. Um, and then, you know, the, I'm going to walk through a few slides of what's on the rest of the page. Uh, it was important to us that this site be designed to be usable on every device. Uh, you know, multi-generational participation requires phone use and, and tablet use, and I'll come back to that in our results. But that was something that we that we were insistent on as we built this out. Um, if you think about the place that is most uh, user-friendly for people to get the information about a particular case, it's the presentation of, by the applicant, by the staff, to, to the, to the um, council or to the planning commission. It's a much more user-friendly interface than somebody trying to read a staff memo or read a bunch of documents. But right now, outside of Lakewood, this is something that's only 
available at the time of the public hearing. You can go and spend your evening listening to the presentation and then have a very limited time to process that information and, and, and formulate your questions and your comments. So one of the innovations of this site is to pre-record those presentations. So, and by pre-record, I don't mean in front of a video camera. We add audio to our, our PowerPoints. So the staff and the applicant both have those done two weeks prior to the live meeting. And that information is up on the website available for the public to view those presentations and learn about the case in that way. Uh, secondly, all of the written documentation, the a memo on the project, the site plan, any attachments, those are, you know, had been traditionally you know, copied and sent to decision makers or, or put into a giant PDF and emailed. Now all of that information is available to decision makers and the public alike on the website in a sort of easy to follow fashion. Um, the decision makers themselves have their own login that contains an, you know, an agenda that they can walk through all of the cases before them on any given week. Um, once you've you know, read the materials and viewed the presentations, the site contains buttons to allow you to actually ask questions. So the first, you know, one of the first buttons on the top is ask city staff. So if you have a, as a citizen have a question for staff, you hit that, a pop-up button comes up, you type your question, and it initiates a back and forth email exchange between you and the plan and the case planner for any any particular case. Um, we also have an ask applicant button, which is something new and, and we've never really done before. But a similar button pulls up a case. You can you can fill in your dialogue box. You know why are you putting the parking on the east side of the building rather than the west side of the building? That initiates a back and forth email with the applicant for the case. Um, the emails are anonymized, sort of like it's on Craigslist, so that you're not actually sharing your email with the applicant and vice versa. Uh, but that exchange can take place, and those emails between citizens and applicants are actually BCC back to staff, uh, so that we can a uh, you know measure the responsiveness, you know monitor the responsiveness of our applicants, and b have access to those answers ourselves. So when we get the same question, decision makers also have an ability to ask questions. We, they, because of the nature of these cases, they can't communicate with the applicant. Um, however, they have an ask staff button as well. So a planning commissioner or a city council can hit that button, ask a question. Unlike with the citizens, it doesn't initiate a back and forth with the case planner. The case planner gets that question, and then they write an answer that's posted for all of the decision makers to see so that they all get access to the same information and the answers to the same, same questions. That doesn't go on the public side, but that goes for the decision makers. Um, and then you've done all that and you know, you've got all the information, you've got your questions answered. Now is your three minutes in front of the mic, right? And so the site offers, um, it, it starts by giving you the review criteria. So you know the decision making criteria that the body's looking at, and then you have your opportunity to insert your, your public comment. That goes up online, both the decision makers and the public can view your comment on the case. Um, one thing that we tried hard to replicate, when you're actually live at a public hearing, there's pros and cons. The, the con for a lot of people is you have to get up and stand in front of a mic and to, you know, do some public speaking. But the pro is you have a captive audience, right? That city council has to at least pretend to sit there and listen to what you're saying. Um, we can't fully represent, uh, replicate that online, but the way we try to do that is by tracking their reading the comments. So when decision makers log in and read comments, the site tracks that and immediately in real time updates the website with how many you know, counselors have read a given comment. So if you, if you comment, you go back on in a couple days, you see that you know, three of seven planning commissioners have read your comment. By the time of hearing, you know, it's, it's ideally seven of seven. Uh, a lot of communities like what included uh, tape um, and stream the radius, we've, we've moved that capacity over to this site so that if you're interested in a case, you go back to it on the night of the hearing, you can watch the hearing, you can go back in the days after and watch the video. And then finally, after a decision's made, we post that on the site. And we've just added a new function where people interested in a case and commenting on a case can sign up for an update, sign up for updates on that case. So they get emailed when the decision's made with the results. Uh, spend a couple minutes before I close talking on how it's worked. We've obviously spent a lot of time, you know, since we created this from scratch in uh, figuring out how to analyze it, how to make sure it's working and collecting a lot of data. And I want to really quickly go through some of that. This is a snapshot of the last eight cases in front of the Planning Commission. And what you see here is, you know, holds true sort of throughout the life of this. Comments uh, on the left in the blue are public hearing number of comments. In the green is online 
public comments, and you'll see very few cases that have equal or more, case, more comments live. The average is one to two times as many comments online as live, so we're overall, we've doubled to triple the number of comments that we take in on each on any given case. Um, moreover, if you sit in a, in a hearing, not everybody that's in that hearing gets up and talks. We also measure sort of how many people come to learn about a case and, and watch the case. And we've compared that against how many people go onto the website and view the presentations. And what we've found is five to 10 times as many people uh, get their information online as come and view it in person. So we're, we're getting significantly more uh, overall participation. Quickly go through this. This you know, validated our choice to, to build it for all devices. Uh, over 40%, close to half of our, uh, our users are participating in things other than desktop. Uh, this is my favorite slide. Um, so this middle graph represents uh, the population of Lakewood over 25, uh, divided out in, in decades. Um, and then you can see it's all, it's very uniformly spread. Every, you know, 25 to 35 are all within, every, every uh, cohort is all within a couple percent of each other. This is our in-person participation. 80%, 55 and older, with, over, a, over a period of six months. And this is our participation in that same six months online. So you can see it much more closely represents the actual demographics of the city, and it really captures those 25 to 55 year olds that we're missing in our in-person participation. So this is one of the, you know, the big takeaways. And final graph, um, uh, point in time. This is when comments come in over a six-month period. Literally hundreds of hundreds of comments. We see spikes in commenting in the late morning at eleven, late afternoon around four, and the late evening around nine. Hundreds of comments over six months, and we didn't receive a single one between six p.m. and eight p.m. And guess when we held our hearings <laughs> between <laughs> at seven p.m. So this was another takeaway is that we're holding our public hearings at literally the last time of day that people want to be participating. Um, and finally, the, you know, the most important thing, uh, or one of the most important things is how are the decision makers using and appreciating the site? And I can say, you know, unequivocally, they are, they really appreciate this tool. Um, they like the expanded participation. They love the, the demographics of that expanded participation and reaching new audiences. Um, they really appreciate the fact that half to uh, two thirds of their comments are now coming in prior to the hearing and they're getting a chance to read them and process them. And so they're not, they're coming into the, the night of the hearing with an understanding of the issues and some of the concerns of the community rather than just hearing it that night. Uh, I won't go through this last slide um, with some of the considerations for communities that are looking to adopt this. Um, my contact information is on there. I'm happy to take questions um, and talk to people or connect them with the, um, with the service that, that's been created. It's, it's now starting in other communities. There are a couple other uh, Colorado communities, a couple of Utah communities that are looking at this, and uh, I think Kansas City is getting up and running uh, with this service as well. So it's, it's, it's really worked well for Lakewood, and I think it's going to prove to uh, expand across the country. Great. Thank you so much, Travis. Um, and I, uh, with the interest of time, we have a couple questions um, that we're going to uh, gonna, gonna go to. Um, the first question I'm going to address uh, to Sarah, probably, but feel free to uh, jump in if you, have, um, if you have thoughts. So we had a question, in the spirit of collaboration with communities, um, how are you working with community, especially underrepresented communities, to design and monitor, monitor community involvement or participation efforts and create kind of co-ownership strategies over those processes? Right, so that's, that's critically important to both equity and inclusivity. And so we, one of the functions that our community connectors play, in addition to going door to door out in their communities, is they help us co-create processes and materials that will work for the community members that they want to help us reach. So we are doing a lot of side-by-side um, -side work as we develop um, actual plans and materials for our work-facing engagement. We also um, 
when we are in the collaborate space, so we have a sub community planning process going on right now that's in the collaborative space. We are using a working group model where we have um, 21 community members, and we made a point of having two community connectors serve as members of that working group to ensure that less loud, less included voices are part of that sub community. All right, um, so then one, uh, I think we've got time for one more question, um, and that is, uh, I, just, I just had a general question about, um, about trust and how, if you've noticed anecdotally or through data, um, I know trust is kind of hard to capture as a data point, but how these efforts are contributing towards increasing the level of trust either between communities and the local government or between communities themselves. Well, um, I can only reflect on the process I've just been through, and um, I think that uh, it's really hard to measure, but um, uh, we did have some comments come in and some results, as I mentioned, um, that we hadn't had before, like the Resource Center, for example. And so we thought that's a great idea, and that's, that's something that wouldn't have come out if we hadn't have made the efforts to really reach out more comprehensively to the community. And so um, I think that, um, you know, obviously it was really important, and, and I'm glad we did it, and, and it has reflect, will reflect in our ultimate plan. I, I mean, I think it's fair that trust in government at all levels is at a historic low, at least it seems, certainly seems that way, and that's something that we're battling, certainly in Lakewood. I, this is a piece of the puzzle, and we're, we're, I think it's early to determine how much this in itself is helping, but that's, I think that's a battle we're all facing. Right. Um, if people, yeah, so if, if there are additional questions, uh, I know there's a couple out there um, that I will try and connect. Um, connect attendees with the, the relevant speakers. But if you have any additional questions uh, from today's session, please email me at mvie, like Metrovision Idea Exchange, mvie at drcog.org, uh, and I'll do my best to get those questions answered for you. Um, we did just have one more thing to announce. Um, and that is that our Dr. Cog's Citizens Academy is, um, is shortly going to be um, shortly going to be accepting applications. Show on the screen. Yeah, so we, we kind of ran out of time. I had a whole uh, spiel to give you about what um, Citizens Academy is. This is Lisa Hood with Dr. Cog again, but we the, in the shortened version of this, Citizens Academy is a seven-week course for residents of the Denver region to learn about various regional issues such as housing, transportation, economic development, um, and civic participation. And it really, the intent of us running this academy and this program is really hitting on a lot of the issues that we've talked about today, getting more people and more um, different types of people involved in our communities and so our applications will open on Thursday. You can find out more about the program on Dr. Fox's website. And if you're interested in applying, um, definitely consider it. Or if there are members of your community who you think would benefit or be interested in this, please let them know. And I wish I could have explained more about it, but it's a great program and definitely ties in really well with everything we've talked about today. Great. Thank you all so much for joining in our session today, and a big thank you to our panelists who have been wonderful, um, and we look forward to seeing you or listening next time.